some of those campaigns that were focused on marketing targets very similar to yourself, college age students, um, you know, people of, of your income level and your status. So we'll discuss that as well. Um, but I think uh, I think this should be interesting for you because you're constantly uh, getting marketed to whether you realize it or not. If you're using social media, you have people that are looking at your interest, they're targeting you, and they're coming after you as individuals, not just in groups anymore. And in, in terms of your background, though, are, um, are you originally from the United States? Yes. Guys, listen up, please. Um, where did you grow up? San Francisco. Okay, ours from San Francisco. And what is your heritage? So, you, did you still have family in uh, either Hong Kong or mainland China? Few, but they're mostly in the US. I'm curious, you know, before we get started, um, what is their reaction to you? Do they consider you an outsider or do they consider you? Yes, I'm an outsider. Okay. <laughs> Why is that? Um, I think it's a little bit different. Uh, my attitude, my ability is to actually help. And that's always going after money. That's a big thing. Kind of allows laughing because it comes from the same background. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just that I don't, my attitude is very weak. At least you have some candidates, so that's the difference between us. Okay, come on up. Everybody? As I mentioned, um, Art has started his own digital marketing firm. And one of the things I was interested in, in just looking at your background on LinkedIn and everything, is that um, there seems to be kind of a, a relative ease in the barriers of entry to actually starting a business in Hong Kong. Right. Did you find that that was the case in... in uh... Yeah, I think the biggest thing is based on getting your visa. That's the biggest thing. Um, I actually have met business owners who have started a business with a partner. They're here. Um, like, from the U.S., I can come here for three months, then I can go to Macau for a day, come back, and then my visa resets. So, so other than the visa, that's the most important thing. Once you get the visa, then setting up um, business registration, uh, it's, it happens very quick. You know, it happens in like one or two weeks. It's very quick. What was it that um, inspired you to come here, though? Um, well, if you look at the U.S. market, it's quite saturated. I'm in technology, and when you look at where the opportunities are, as far as where the supply and demand is for what I do, uh, demand is high in Hong Kong, but uh, supply is very low. So looking, there's a lot of, you're right, there's a lot of um, low barriers to entry, start your own business, have a digital marketing firm, right? Uh, but there's a lot of people who just don't have that level of experience. Uh, at least where I'm coming from, I breathe and live technology in Silicon Valley for right. a long time. Yeah. I, I mean, that's the mecca of right. the digital age. Right. And I'm just curious, um, in, in terms of the level of sophistication, Right. In, in a place like Silicon Valley, or maybe just the U.S. as a whole. Sure. What's the comparison between there and Hong Kong? Um, so, just to give a little background, so I was born and raised in San Francisco, and the, the first technology piece or computer that I worked on was a computer <coughs> with monochrome screen, and data was kept on a cassette drive. Okay, so my parents started me off really early. So imagine where I you know, um, come from and where I am now, and I lived in Vietnam, for a couple of years prior to Hong Kong, and I look at how. Now, did you see a business environment there that you thought was was right? Um, there is, but making the level of money that I'm accustomed to was a little bit difficult, and also you have a lot of barriers with the government. So one thing I like about Hong Kong, of course, things are probably going to change over the years. Um, there is going to be a difference of working in Hong Kong and whether or not you want to set up your shop in mainland China. So for me, Hong Kong was easier to get in. Uh, in mainland China, same with Vietnam, a lot of times you have to find a business partner. So that's high risk because there's a lot of stories that you hear through the business network that you partner up with someone, you infuse some cash, um, and they maybe leave with your money. And you in mainland China, China or Hong Kong? In Vietnam and in mainland. Okay. Yeah. So here um, I felt it was, uh, I, I didn't need a business partner. That was important for me. So I started off my own. Uh, I went through a process of trying to hire people, but being a small business is very difficult. So one of my tactics is, it's almost as, as, as I'm a freelancer. So I work with other small businesses that I partner with to 
to serve clients. So I can't do everything, so I'll get a graphic designer, I'll get a uh, developer, a coder programmer, um, I might get some people from PR. So collectively, I'm actually the person that's very good at going out, getting the sales leads, and managing the project. So that's basically what I do. Say this class was a business, Internet Media and Society decides to incorporate, and we hire you to help us. Um, you know, usually the, the orthodox method of marketing is kind of holistic. It includes advertising and, and public relations. Um, we go to traditional media outlets like television and, and magazines. But there's been a, a very dramatic shift, almost completely to digital. Right. And would you, as our strategist, recommend, especially since we're reaching a young, hip audience, um, that we go only digital? Uh, no, I don't. Because that's actually one of the things I work with my clients with is coming to Hong Kong and going back to the question is the sophistication here in Hong Kong. I think a lot of the traditional, what we call mass media type uh, communications still exist very much so in Hong Kong. Now, when you look out on the digital side, what's really happening is everything that used to happen through mass media is now happening on social. But it's more intimate, sharing stories one-on-one -on -one with people you know, and that's how it usually spreads. So instead of uh, hoping that someone picks up your newspaper, hoping that someone turns on the TV to watch your TV program, it, you're actually hearing it from your friends. And that's what normally progresses. You hear it from your friends, let's say about a TV show. Then it might pique your interest and you start watching the show. So that's where it actually gets more effective and that's why everyone's very excited about it. So as far as moving all to digital, for me, one of the things that, um, that I've seen a lot of the stats come out is that there's so many people on the mobile phones. Like someone posted a picture of a group of college students in a Starbucks. There's about six of them. And the caption was, this is how the, the young Hong Kong uh, community uh, socializes. So basically, they're in, they're in, in Starbucks and everyone's on their phone, right? So the argument can be made, the argument can be made, yes, you go all digital, but not really, because it's still, uh, whether you're online or offline, that, that relationship that you're building with that person, with that friend, it's, it's a personal relationship. Some of it is online, some of it's offline. So from a marketer's point of view, how you want to reach those people, it's actually more of a one-to-one -one, uh, relationship way rather than me blasting or hoping that someone sees a, a banner ad and, and people get eyes on it. I have no idea who's looking at it. But when, when I tell people about it on social media, and more importantly, when they engage with me at the same time, that actually is more proof of that my message got across. Right? So. Yeah, you have direct evidence, right? Exactly. exactly. I think what's been interesting too, we've had discussions about the Obama presidential campaign and other campaigns where, in some ways, individual voters receive solicitation somehow. And, and the same thing is happening on a commercial level in marketing. And I think some of us feel a little creeped out that our privacy is, is being violated sometimes when we get ads that are so directed towards our, us and our interests and we're not exactly sure how that was ascertained. Right. Now, we could put likes or our interests on a Facebook or Weibo page, but I know that I've received advertising sometimes based on messages that I've sent to someone. And if you could track for us how this happens, how you as marketers are able to capture that information and use it to, to come back to us um, you know, for point of purchase sales or simply just to get our attention for a certain product or services. Well, I, I, I'll note a couple of examples. So, um, I'll talk about Google. I don't know how many people here use uh, Gmail for your email. But how many people do? Okay. So, I don't know if you know this, but Google will actually analyze the words that you use in your email, right? Certain keywords that pop up frequently, right? So, what ends up happening is the ads that you see when you're using Google will show up based on the keywords that you use frequently or the things you talk about in your email. Sounds creepy, right? It sounds really creepy. But it's on their platform, and if you really look at the, the privacy rights and what they're able to do, um, I guess for the, the biggest part is whether or not they're selling your information. That's where people are, are getting freaked out with their personal information, right? But they're just pulling keywords, and that's acceptable. 
So that's how they serve up the ads. That's one way. Okay. Now, how do you guys get that information? Are you buying it from them, or is it, is it like a subscription base? How, how do you know, and, and how does that become valuable to you? Considering that there are so many millions of people, and who right, right. cares what keywords you know I use as opposed to right, right. So there's a lot of focus on using keywords for advertisements, and when you sign up for doing Google Ads, they will ask you what keywords you're interested in using. So if you've got a product that's based on, let's say, if you're a photographer and you want to target people in a certain region, let's say Hong Kong. In a, uh, let's say you're, you're a wedding photographer, so you're looking for people in their early 20s to late 20s, right? So you, you can set up keywords based on what these people are looking for, a photographer, a wedding photographer, you can even say um, in Kowloon, you can actually tailor it down as much as you want. Um, but that's what you do. So what ends up happening is that now you're on their ad network and you pay, for example, how many times your ad is shown, it's, it's called click for impression, or it, you pay if someone actually clicks on your ad, which usually costs a little bit more. So this is how it is. You pay for it, you're hoping that people will see it based on these keywords that you're, for your interests that you've expressed in the past, and then they click on it, and then they drive traffic to either another site, or a Facebook uh, fan page, or um, anything else else. And to make that effective for a marketer like you, though, how do you, how do you disseminate you know, which individuals you're going to get this information from? Or do yeah. they package it for you? Like all the keywords that use photography yeah. in Hong Kong are all grouped together. Yeah. And, and just immediately through an algorithm pop up your ad. Right. Right. Well, I have to say that in Hong Kong, there's actually a, a large number of businesses that are focusing on this whole keyword search optimization technique. Okay? For me, I was never a big fan. Uh, that's why I like using social media. The reason why is the whole point that, you know, for me as an individual, I get a lot of spam. In the past, I got a lot of uh, um, email, junk email, but technology has changed where a lot of the emails now go to my junk folders, so I get less spam. Facebook came around, all of a sudden I see all these posts from people about things I don't care about. Um, actually, when I first started Facebook, I joined a game called Mafia Wars. And I kept on playing it, and then I didn't really understand the concept of Facebook. Um, and I actually would play it during work time. So some of my clients are thinking, like, what, this guy's just playing Mafia Wars all day. He's, like, constantly getting these automatic posts. I reached a new level, I've had a new friend, and all these things. Um, then I start to understand, okay, wait, what am I using Facebook for, right? Um, so, but I've actually seen the sophistication of how users are using Facebook change in the past two years. Um, I used, to, well, before my perception was people like to brag about themselves, what they're doing. Um, of course, there's a lot of sharing of stories, photos, um, but it's more of uh, what they tell them what they're doing. Maybe they graduated school, they're pretty proud of they want everyone to know, right? But now I think it's very, very personal now. And for a business, instead of the mass marketing, which I'm not into, because for me, I don't want to be mass marketed. But there, every time a new technology comes out, something like that would happen. Like for example, SMS, MMS, all of a sudden I start getting these messages. Um, and I just delete it. It doesn't work, it doesn't work. Same with keywords, it's hit or miss. Just because they see your ad based on that keyword, you really don't know if there's real interest. At least with social media, you have an understanding of the background of what that person is because they build their social media profile. Now, whether or not it's true, obviously, is a different story. And as a marketer, that's how we, we, we start off. We meet someone new, we connect with them, they, add it, they get added as a fan. Uh, we get to understand them. That's like what we when we first meet them. But I actually only spend the time with the people, uh, let's say on my fan page or on Twitter or wherever on social media, um, that, that are, are engaging with me. That's where I spend the time on, because they're, they're listening, they're reading, they want to engage with me. Everyone else I really don't care about at that point. I may still market to them through Facebook in a certain way, but where I spend most of my time to be more efficient and effective is the people that want to connect with me. And I think that is that uh, the author, Malcolm Gladwell, uh, talked about the influencers, right. that, that looking at a small group of people as 
most important, the ones that, as you said, that engage with you, really are, is the place where you spend your resources and your time, because yeah. everyone else is kind of sitting out there watching or stalking. Right. Um, I'm curious, on that same level with social media, I personally face this, this kind of weird dilemma about how much personal and how much professional. Right. You know, part of my Facebook I like to use to promote the books that I write and so on. But at the same time, my wife posts pretty much everything that happens in our family, every meal that we eat. And so it becomes this conglomeration of, of both personal and professional. But at the same time, I think it makes it more human. And as a marketer, have you found that, that when someone is more human, that they have a tendency to be able to be more commercially successful as well. Exactly. Um, because set, you know, there's a constant pressure to set up a fan page, which seems very kind of uh, static and in some ways antiseptic. Um, but do we today, in order to do business, have to engage people as human beings? Yes, that, that's the whole thing of being social, right? Um, so before, like I was mentioning, when you're mass marketing, there's no intimate relationship that you're building. Through social, uh, you are able to understand the user uh, a little bit better. So I remember, so I've always been a business owner. Actually, after, right after college, I set up my own shop as a consultant, and I worked with different corporations, and I was freelancing. Um, and the whole point of that is that the way that I used to market, it used to be telephone books, advertising in newspapers. Um, it used to be maybe TV commercials if they were cheap enough. Um, and then we used to do focus groups, so you get a lot of people in the room, and you ask them all these questions about your product, uh, maybe to understand how people would perceive your company so you can develop your brand, your message of what you're, what you're trying to uh, pr produce some value for your consumers. So um, social media actually makes it more effective and much easier because people are engaging and telling you. That's why uh, if any of you have used social media for customer service, it's actually very powerful. People can have that voice um, it doesn't matter if it's good or bad. If you get a lot of bad comments, at least you can respond and say, we're trying to change it, or respond to it. Um, and everyone knows about it. You can actually be more effective in saying, we know this is an issue, and we're working on it. And you can kind of, uh, I guess more or less, control all that bad publicity that's happening, right? Whereas before, what you had to do was, if you had all the bad publicity, you would have to write an article, get it published in all these uh, newspapers or on TV, and then uh, the message may or may not get heard. So I think people like being human, that you're actually having that one-on-one -on -one conversation. For example, I have a problem with uh, my IBM laptop, and I complain, and I'm doing it on social media. Then IBM comes and responds to me. The people in my, my network... Can I ask you a question about that? Yeah. Um, how quickly did they respond to you, and, and was it kind of uh, a general complaint, or did you specify within circles that you know they would they'd be reading. Yeah, so um, this is actually on multiple platforms. This is actually through a blog. And the blog had a pretty good following uh, with IBM. But with social media, yes, it's quite massive. And there's only so many channels you can control. Now, there's a lot of tools that you can pick up where all this information is coming from. So it does make it easier. Um, oh, but I do want to, want to address like the whole privacy thing, too. So, and. Um, the thing about uh, being social, you're obviously on a platform, you're giving them all this information. Uh, you have to keep in mind, it's actually in your control what type of information you provide. So I think for most technologists, if they always give the option to the end consumer that they have control, even though it's just a perception, that's actually what people want. So as an end consumer, um, if you're, like I forget that I signed up maybe for an email list, and all of a sudden I get some emails from people I've never heard of. Um, I wanted to address that really quickly because uh, um, besides the keywords and search engine optimizations and running with the ads, there are people who just collect emails and they'll sell it off to uh, through a different advertising network and they don't let you know. I mean, sometimes it's in very small print that says that we're collecting the emails and we're allowed to use it in any way we want. Um, and one of the things that is always enticing when they do email list building, which we call it, is that they usually give you something for free. Oh, here's an ebook about starting up your own business. And if you really want the information, it's free, you give them your email address. But in the fine print, it says something a little bit different. Sell it. <laughs> right, exactly. So, yeah. 
One thing that's been kind of interesting too, though, is um, the development of social media. You know, both, both looking at the commercial perspectives, um, but but also um, in terms of what you do have to offer them. I mean, there really is no free lunch, right? Right. When, when you're offering information, and, and I think you know, especially for members of my class, their generation, privacy isn't a major concern. They don't think about it. They post pictures that, that might be a little bit um, compromising in some ways. Until you get older, you start to, to want to spool in those privacy issues. Um, what should they be aware of as consumers in dealing with social media? What should perk up their ears and, and make them more cautious um, as they sign up for different sites or participate in different sites? Well, I think if you use a lot of the sites that are quite, so, so within social media, if you think about why people like a page and why you might like a page, a lot of times they have that function where it says, um, oh, 10 of your friends like this page. So inherently, you kind of build this trust within your own friend circle on Facebook, right? So when you're going outside to a different website, um, that's why they're trying to tie in all these other socials. Now, that's one of the things that is a kind of perception thing. You might think the site is okay until all of a sudden the site but you find out the site is selling your information, right? Um, what would be a good clue that that's happening? Uh, <laughs> someone complaining about it. I mean, actually, it's really hard to detect sometimes that someone's going to do something bad. Sometimes it's a, um, a disgruntled employee that does it. So you never know. I mean, I think with technology in general, there's always going to be security concerns. So there's certain things that you can do to make sure you protect yourself. There's obviously the information that's going to be important to you that you want to keep private. You need to think about what that is. Okay? For me, I do a lot of purchasing online. And what I do is I actually use one, the same credit card when I buy something. And the reason I won't use this credit card is because the customer service is very good at um, taking my complaints. Like if someone had stole my information and they're starting to buy all the things online, they would refund me. They're very good at that. So that's the card I use. So where most people don't really think about it, they might set up all these different accounts, right, with different credit cards. So if you think also, as far as, um, the t I don't know how many email accounts pe people usually have these days, I have many email accounts. I use a specific email account when I sign up for sites that I'm not quite familiar with. So if they spam me, it's not like my main one. It doesn't filter my personal email address. So there's controls that you can set in place to protect yourself. And I think that's the most important thing to really think about what you're, how much information you're providing online. If you don't want to do it, if there's a form and you're, you're asking too much information, uh, you don't provide it, don't provide it. You know, they never get caught up into the, the whole marketing picture. Yeah. Are there some of the campaigns that you've worked on that, um, that have targeted um, students of you know, this class's age, yes. that, that maybe you could share with us and, and how you both gathered information about them and how you marketed to them? Right, right, okay. So I, I have a few slides I wanted to share. Um, to talk about it. Okay, so I put together just like eight slides so I can uh, share with you some case studies about some of the projects I've worked on. Um, so this is what, uh, as a marketer myself, other marketers work differently, but this is what I focus on, okay? So I'm always looking at new technology and platforms like, um, uh, let's say, WeChat, which has you know, been very popular these days, as a platform to understand and, and know that this is what users want, right? So, if they've got 100 million users on WeChat, uh, if they got a billion users on Facebook, I know that I don't have to fight them to be on something like a customized app that I'm trying to promote, right? So basically I look at what the user's behavior, this is one of the most important things in marketing, and that's why I was talking about focus groups. You look at what the consumers want, where the demands are, and you try to serve to that. So um, I look at, things that are driving change to user behavior, uh, understanding how to leverage existing networks to discover micro, what I call micro niche communities. So within Facebook, you can have people who are part of HKU but uh, are interested in dance, right? Like these, these dance troops out here. 
So there could be a group on that. So for me, if I am maybe a dance school and I want to promote more students from the universities, I would go into that group. I would just go broad uh, mass market to all the Facebook users um, in Hong Kong. So also I look at ways to leverage data from social profiles. Like my example about Gmail, they pull data in a certain way with keywords. For me, I look at further defining the users that I'm trying to target or the people who are already connected with my business. Um, what most businesses focus on here now I talk about is kind of pulling all together analytics. So the analytics side, if you're in the digital space, what most companies try to do is that if you visit their website, they'll try to track where you go in their website and see where what's more common, where you go, what you click on, right? Um, and just to give a quick example, Citibank has a pretty huge digital team and they changed their uh, website instantaneously, daily. So if they're running a promotion and let's say they put a banner ad on the website and it's not getting enough clicks, they'll immediately change the color, maybe the graphic on it, the position, the size, and these are the kind of things that they do with the analytics. Um, the other side of it is getting analytics on redemption behavior, how often you're coming into the store, how much uh, spend that you're, uh, how much money you're spending when you come in, and also uh, the what I call the social socially expressed sentiment. Uh, are people talking about your product or service online? What people are interested in? Uh, what's hot? What's the trends? Things like that. So, going into the example here. So I've um, there's a lot of stats that run around, but basically, in uh, China as a whole, including Hong Kong. There are about 500 million people who access the internet through a laptop, right? And 420 million are accessing the internet through a mobile phone. So if, I'm sure you've already noticed that there's this big shift from a bigger screen to a smaller screen, right? And where, where the behavior is changing is even for students, I mean, how many people, you're on laptops, people are surfing on the phones. Um, if you're doing work, if you're doing schoolwork, most likely you'll want a bigger screen, right? Because you don't want to strain your eyes. Um, but for personal stuff, so that's what's important for marketers, is where do you spend most time to do surfing or looking for information? It's going to be on a tablet or on a phone. And if you haven't seen um, uh, the new Surface laptop by uh, Microsoft, you can actually detach your screen from your computer and use it as a tablet. That's where the direction is going. So it's more of this mobility of the device. So if we look at WeChat, this is an example. Uh, so it started by Tencent. Uh, how many people are here on WeChat? Lots, little, okay. So um, obviously they want to go to a broader audience and build their uh, subscriber or their user base. And they're offering uh, credits, FB credits, Facebook credits, which actually you can use to download apps um, or buy things within the Facebook application. Knowing that in mainland, there's no Facebook, people don't use Facebook, they want to get the rest of the world, right? The one billion people. And so this is just a way of, you know, a social platform that's already established that is now using social. And this is actually being taken on by the younger generation. So a lot of, uh, I've seen some micro stats on this is that there's a large population that are mostly just students that are on this application. Um, so if you look at, uh, this is one of the ways, um, I don't know how many people understand uh, when you go to a website or you go to a mobile app, there's always an option to connect with your Facebook account, your Google Plus account, your Twitter account, things like that. Um, this is what happens, and maybe a lot of people, as far as on the security side, people don't realize. So I was on this one website. I clicked that I wanted to log in with my Google, uh, Google Plus account. It's asking me, it's telling me that in order for me to have access, they're gonna pull information, my basic information that I've made available on my account. They want my email address, and the last one is basically uh, they want to perform operations when I'm not using the application. 
right? Now, <laughs> like, like you're, you're gonna use it on my behalf, what does that mean, right? So, you think, see things like this, it's kind of like people just click on it. Oh, it's okay, no worries, you know, click allow access. And this is what is the general behavior, and this is why a lot of marketers are doing it. So, what, what, what does that mean, manage your data? Uh, I have to do that. Yeah, so that's the, that's one thing that I was, uh, so basically what Feedly is, Feedly is a aggregated content software. So I can actually, uh, well Google Reader actually doesn't exist anymore, so this was a little bit outdated. But I used to bookmark a lot of blogs, a lot of news sites, um, uh, Twitter accounts, Facebook accounts, and I actually pulls all my data into almost like a magazine newspaper form. So I can read it as my customized news feed. Um, and that's what Feedly is. So it manages my data as far as all those inputs that I've already defined in the reader. So that's okay with me. Uh, my email address, I was okay with that because of the account that I'm using. Basic information, I built it out to a degree that I'm okay of the public knowing about. But this whole uh, performance operations when I'm not using the application, I can understand it if they're managing my data in Google Reader, but it's, it's quite broad, right? It's not very detailed of what they're really, really doing with my account. Um, so here's one of my clients that I'm working with now. Uh, this, is, uh, this is an application uh, that you share your, I guess, your fashion sense. Um, they're using it as a social app because the common behaviors, especially on Facebook, people like to share pictures of food, places they go to, of their friends, maybe of themselves, right? So what they're focusing on is college students, people all the way from 13 years old to maybe mid-30s. And they're mostly females, okay? Hardly any men on this platform. Um, so it looks like it's free to use, right? So the draw is like, wow, it's a cool app, uh, I can take a picture of my my outfit today. You can tag it with you know the brand that you're wearing, um, and it's got a whole database of all these different brands. And then you can have your friends part of the community that also like it. So there's a lot of stuff that, that makes it fun to share this within that one community and not openly on Facebook. If you wanted to, you could push it out to Twitter and Facebook. Okay. So what's the big deal? Why, why would a company spend so much money to develop this app and market it? Well, the end result is that one thing is it's a current user behavior that people are used to and people like doing, and there's a trend for the young market. So they built it, and they know that there's the, a demand for people wanting to have this experience. Um, and, and in Japan, they very quickly grew to 30,000 users and for them, it's a small number, they want more, but they focused on quality people. So they pulled in fashion bloggers, um, boutique or very small fashion designers, and small brands so they can help uh, kind of promote their, their new designs on this platform. Now where the biggest, where the money comes in is basically, if you can imagine what's happening, right? If you kind of step back from a business point of view, you're getting many different looks that are now defining the fashion for a city, for a community. Now, if you think from a brand perspective, let's say I'm coach, I can now understand how many people in Hong Kong in a specific area like a specific look, a bag, a type of bag, or a type of scarf, or accessories, right? So that's the power of it because you can kind of see where the trends are going. Furthermore, when people are sharing, a lot of times people will also write bad things. Oh, that's a horrible purse, or I think it's too expensive, or I don't know um, where to purchase it. So all these interactions that happen on the mobile uh, device within this community, the brands now can connect with them saying, hey, we have a store, we have it in stock here. It's a very nice way to not do mass marketing. You have a community of people who are already interested in not just in fashion, but people actually follow specific brands. So you do have a new product line that comes out, you push it out to the community, they get to see it, um, and they go to the store. So some of these applications, especially connected to social media, can be data traps. Yeah. And they're fun to use, but they're, they're looking to mine information. They're, they're, they're always data traps. When you think about the biggest area that I was here, 
um, in the app space as people are always creating some kind of games. Games on Facebook, games for the mobile phone. Uh, the first initial approach was a lot of those, those mobile advertisements, right, that pop up for maybe other games to download or for some other advertisers, right? So yeah, it's a, it, it, nothing's free. There's always something that they're doing. And then a lot of these games now are doing the same thing. Uh, connect with Facebook. They're pulling your information. You might Our, not know this, but they're doing that. We have to start wrapping it up because we have a debate, but I'd like to open it up for questions yeah. from, uh, from our students. If that's okay, good. yeah. Is there any questions? They're, they're always shy initially, and then I come in, I shove a microphone yeah. in their face, and they yeah. have to do it. Any questions? Well, let, let's, ask, um, let's ask a question about, uh, does, maybe does anyone really have any concerns over security? And if not, why that is? Cause I, that, that's a great question. Um, are you guys in general worried about privacy or security in, in your use of the internet, period? Raise your hand if you do have security concerns or privacy concerns. Yeah, what, what's your concern? Yeah, so, so that is one of the strategies that marketers do. I do it myself. But the thing that really annoys me is that some people will not give you the option. Like, they'll say, this is what's going to happen. They're going to post on your behalf that you like this page. But if I have, you can actually set it to, um, if you click no, then you can't access the app. But at least you have, for me, I give the option. If they take it off, that's fine with me. And I think that's the most important thing for marketers. They need to make sure the controls in the user's hands. Uh, how do you feel about the monopoly of Facebook as our digital like passport? Uh, what do you mean by digital passport? Well, like our identity online. Right. Are almost we we like a lot of different communities are linking to uh, Facebook right. as a way for us to consolidate all of our online identities. Right. So that gives Facebook a very powerful monopoly. Sure. Online, right? Well, online you can actually create many different types of profiles. Facebook is just one of them. It's the most popular one. So yes, I've heard a lot of people on the side, like when you when you graduate and you go look for a job, uh, HR uh, departments will look at your social media profiles, right? So you can have a professional one on LinkedIn. You can have a, pro a public one, like more personal, on Facebook. Uh, you can have your own blog, things like this. Actually, you should use it to your advantage to build out your portfolio to give employers, or let's say you're going to go to get your MBA, you give that impression of who you are. So that's why they're saying use it more um, uh, closely and, and monitor. Don't post bad things and make sure it's you know the true you. Um, but on some hands, some people don't really care. Like I want to have an open voice. If it's if it's negative and people disagree with me. With me it should be okay, but at least it's okay to have a point of view, just as long as you're not posting things that are maybe not appropriate. <laughs> Any other questions? Let me ask you this. If, if we were going to interview you for jobs today, we brought you all up individually and questioned you, and said, let us look at your Facebook and your social media accounts. How many of you would be okay with us doing that, and how many of you would feel like there might be something compromising on that account that we shouldn't see? How many feel that they would be okay with us asking to see their social media? Raise your hand. You're talking okay. about this class? Yeah, this class specifically. Okay. How many of you feel there might be something compromising, that, that, or, or you have some kind of objection to sharing with an employer your social media? A few of you? Okay. Think about that. I guess it's, it's, it's a good lesson that if you do feel there's something objectionable on there, um, they're going to find it eventually, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think that's actually a very interesting that um, not a whole lot of people raise their hand because um, people know you. I assume that there's a relationship that they trust you. And as a marketer, there's a reason why 
there's this barrier of why they don't want you to share their information. So as a marketer, that's exactly the position I would take to educate the class why they're going to use it, how they're going to use it, but very, be very transparent about it. We have to wrap it up, but I'm wondering if it's okay to class if they want to contact you through social media. Yeah, yeah. Are they able to do that? Do you want to give out your... Oh, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's up here. Yeah. There's a lot of things that we don't get to cover in here just with the shortage of time, but uh, Art's been pretty open about these things. Yeah. So if you want to contact him on any of these social medias, ask him further questions. Um, he certainly is an expert in the field, and we're, we're very grateful for your time. I do want to mention one thing. I actually run... Um, if anyone here familiar with meetup.com, so if you go to this website called meetup.com, M-E-E-T-U-P.com, I run two groups, um, and they're all about just educating at least once a month on a certain topic around marketing, around running your own business. So if any of you are interested, you're more than welcome to come. It's uh, something that I do at least once a month. Big round of applause for our lady. Thank you for having me. Seven or debate number seven. Please come up and set up for opposition or proposition.